I'll open in prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can dig deep into it and we find so many treasures. Um, and I pray that that's what we'll find today and that you will, I know you're speaking to us, but I pray that you'll help us to hear, and help us to apply it to our lives. And your word is truth. Fill us with your truth. Lift this up to you in Jesus' name. So uh, I'm going to say this just for the sake of the, the camera or the video, is that uh, I'm, my notes are much longer because I've included all the Bible verses in there and, um, and the questions at the end. So uh, there's a lot on here. It's three pages long, uh, both double-sided, so really six pages. And uh, I will probably not be able to cover all the Bible verses, so you can go back later and, and uh, look at those and, and uh, really encourage you to look at the questions at the end and, and to just review it uh, after we go through this. So this week is uh, called Sanctification, Growth in Likeness to Christ. Is, uh, that What sanctification means is to be made holy or set apart um, from the world uh, in the Christian sense of the word. So uh, we come to Christ, but then we're being sanctified or set apart. Um, how? By being becoming more and more like Christ and taking on his characteristics. Um, so this is part of chapter, or part five. Um, so we're on um, 23. We've already talked about uh, many different aspects of the process of becoming a Christian. And most of them, we find out, are God alone, God doing the work, God calling us, God regenerating us, um, God choosing us in the very beginning. Sanctification, we're going to find out, is something that uh, is more of a cooperation between us and God. And uh, so, um, so that's where we're at. So a couple questions. How do we grow in Christian maturity? And I think that word maturity is really, really important uh, because no one likes to see a 20-year-old baby. <laughs> uh, someone who is sucking their thumb or <laughs> hasn't learned how to talk correctly or walk walk yet. Uh, so it's cute at a certain age. And uh, I guess we could say new converts to Christ are cute in some of the things they do and think, um, but uh, that wouldn't be something that they would want to continue on um, 10, 15, 20 years down the road um, as they grow in Christ. So, um, so maturity, we want to be mature. We don't want to be big babies. And I think uh, a big problem in the church uh, today is a lot of people taking kind of a passive view, good morning, um, kind of a passive view on uh, growing in Christ and thinking it just happens automatically. And, um, and uh, so just talking about our role in it and uh, what we can do to make sure that we mature in our faith, uh, to me, I think this is really super important um, for that reason. And then what are the blessings of Christian growth is another question. So sanctification is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. So we progress or we mature, we grow um, in different aspects of our faith. And so that we're progressive goes there. So just to uh, look at some of the differences between justification, which I covered last week, and sanctification. So justification was more of a legal standing. What does God have to say about us in a formal sense, what has God declared about us? And but we know that God decides to look at us as we as sinless and, or, or not guilty. That's part of justification. But we also know that we are sinful and that we continue to sin. And so justification involves our legal standing, the way God chooses to look at us. Where sanctification involves what's going on on the inside. How are we growing? What's our internal condition? So justification is something that happens once for all time. God, you know, at, at the moment of our conversion, God is deciding to view us a certain way. Sanctification, on the other hand, is continuous throughout our life. Uh, so that's why it's progressive. You know, it's, it's, we're changing. Justification was entirely God's work. Sanctification is our cooperation with God. Justification um, is God looking at us as if we are perfect and treating us as if we're perfect in this life. But we know we're not, and so sanctification understands that, no, we're not perfect. We have a lot of growing to do, and, and in actuality, we're going to find out that we don't ever reach perfection um, in this life. 
Uh, justification is something that's the same in all Christians. Um, that's part of what it means to become a Christian, is God declaring us not guilty. But sanctification, we look around, and one of the biggest complaints that the world has is all those Christians who are babies in the faith, even though they've been Christians for many years, and seeing that they're, they seem to be hypocritical, they aren't growing, um, they're stuck in some way. And so sanctification is greater in some than in others. And part of the reason for that is because it involves our cooperation. You know, not everyone cooperates with God to the same degree. So sanctification has a definite beginning at regeneration. So there's three stages. And the first one is, yes, there is a beginning. First one would be an initial moral change. Um, the way I like to explain it uh, in simple terms is um, before we become Christians, morally, if, if sin was like a swimming pool, we're diving in. And we're, you know, we're, we have no problem jumping in this pool of sin. Afterwards, uh, for various reasons, we may fall in to sin. Uh, there's temptation all around us. There's habits that we have to overcome. There's, there's lies that uh, you know, we get trapped in. There's a lot of different pitfalls, but it's more of a falling in. And some people like to walk way too close to the edge of that pool um, because they can't admit to themselves that they would like to fall in. Uh, but uh, So we need to stay far from it. But um, there's a moral change in that we don't want to just dive in anymore into sin. And so that's the way, kind of like a simple way that I look at it. We just don't want to. And uh, a lot of people say, well, if, if you're a Christian, that just means you can pray to receive Christ and then you can keep on sinning as much as you want. Well, you know what? Uh, I guess we can. It's just that we don't want to. Um, God changes our desires and our hearts towards sin. And uh, so if we still want to that bad, then maybe we haven't uh, received Christ. Maybe we did it in word only and, and uh, there was not a, a regeneration of our heart. So. Titus 3.5, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal. Um, so just a, the idea that there, at rebirth we are renewed, we have new desires. It, we just need to let our lifestyle and our habits and our, you know, our, our character start to change as a result of that renewed heart. 1 John 3.9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. So this is talking more about those habitual sins, those, uh, again, the, the, the willing, willing jumping into sin. Um, they just can't do it. If they do, they're filled with guilt, because the Holy Spirit is now living within them, not just affecting them from the outside. So, um, yeah, why? Because they have been born again. They have a new spirit within them. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. The reason I highlighted the word were there is because sanctification is something that happens at reverse, at uh, regeneration, um, at rebirth, but it is something that is happening, and it's something that will happen. So it, uh, it has one of those aspects of, of already beginning, but going on and being completed when we're with Christ. Acts 20, 32, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. To build something means that there has to, it has to begin being built. There has to be a beginning, and that happens at um, rebirth. Um, Romans 6, 11 is talking about the process of becoming born again and becoming a Christian. And we can count your, it says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So um, there's, there's, we're not just reborn as far as coming to life, but there's also something happens where a part of us becomes dead to sin, and that would be, you know, that give, um, the changing of our desires in our heart. So we have a fundamental change in the power of, or authority over us. So why is it that we do have that change of desire and that change of heart? It's because it's no longer ourselves who's the, the, the authority of our lives or, or even Satan or, or the world or the temptation. There's actual, we have power behind this change in our lives. And that power is, is uh, you know, who is our master? Who, who is over us? Who is our authority? So Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall no longer be your master, 
because you're not under law but under grace. Um, and and it and it did talk about you know the fact that the law doesn't save us. It doesn't doesn't keep us from sinning. It just makes us aware of our sin, and uh, it helps us to know what it is we're striving for. Romans six eighteen. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Romans six twelve to thirteen. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Uh, that word reign talks about a kingdom. The king is reigning on his throne. Um, it was sin that was reigning in the th on the throne of our lives. We have a different master now. Romans six eleven. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ, to God in Christ Jesus. Um, uh, sanctification also involves a reorientation of our desires so that we no longer have a dominant love for sin in our lives. So, yeah, if, we, if we're totally candid, and uh, hopefully we're being honest, but if we're totally candid and, and uh, uh, you know, speaking the truth, you know, why, why do people sin? Part of the reason is because it's fun. <laughs> um, part of the reason is because it's enjoyable. Uh, you know, uh, if you have an anger problem, you know, like uh, giving someone a string of obscenities is, you know, it's it's a way of releasing that pressure, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, we don't, it's not, it doesn't have to dominate our lives. So, um, so if you find that there's a certain sin in your life and you have to say, you know what, I kind of enjoy doing that, um, uh, it doesn't mean the love goes away or the desire to sin goes away or the, I guess, the enjoyment. It's just that it doesn't have to control us. It's, it's you know, we're not chained to it anymore. Romans six seventeen to 18, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Number two, sanctification increases throughout life. So Romans uh, 6, 11 to 13 says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. I've heard, um, well, there's a tract called My Heart, Christ's Home that compares our life to a house that has many rooms and God is working in some of the rooms, well, hopefully he's working in all the rooms at the same time, but on a conscious level, we know God is working in certain areas of our life. And later in life, we might discover, you know what, there's a closet that I've been holding out on God and I have not allowed God into that area of my life. And that closet is full of dead bones and filth and needs to be cleaned out. And so this is what it's talking about every part of yourself. That's what God is striving to do, is to work in every single part of our lives, every room. Um, so uh, Romans 6.19 talks about uh, that it's leading to holiness. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So that would be an indication of how sanctification is increasing in our lives. It's ever-increasing. Um, we're becoming filled with God's glory as we become like the one who is glorified, Christ. And so there's an ever-increasing glory uh, as God has his way over more and more of our lives. Um, Philippians 3, 9, 9 through 14 talks about this. I'm going to read just the end. One thing I do, forgive, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So uh, there's this emphasis uh, here on our role. We need to press on. We have goals. We, we, we maybe, this is why um, mentorship is so important because we see other Christians who are more mature. We want to kind of follow their path. We want, it, it's good to set goals and to, to have something to strive for. Um, and so we press on. And I put this on the end because um, there are so many verses in the Bible. Really, the, the majority of the New Testament is written to Christians, encouraging them towards maturity, whether it's individual maturity or maturity as a part of the larger church. But um, so there's no end to, you know, how many verses I could put here. So I'm going to read this. It says, there's no need for multiple additional quotations here because much of the New Testament is taken up with instructing believers in various churches on how they should grow in 
likeness to Christ. All the moral exhortations and commands in the New Testament epistles apply here because they all exhort believers to one aspect or another of greater sanctification in their lives. The expectation of the New Testament authors is that our sanctification will increase throughout our Christian lives. So, yeah, so this is a case where, I mean, we're trying to do Bible doctrine, trying to give all the verses that have to do with a certain subject, but in this case, it's impossible. It's, we, I might as well just lay a Bible down on the table, and, or a New Testament anyway, and the Old Testament. And uh, So, um, sanctification is completed at death. So we're talking about how it began at regeneration, how it continues, how we're growing, but now, well, how is it completed? It's completed at death for our souls, and when the Lord returns for our bodies. Okay, So there's this time when we are separated from our bodies, we're with God in heaven. Um, and then when the final resurrection happens, we'll be reunited with our bodies, and that's when it's completed in a bodily form. So sin, sin still remains in our hearts throughout this life. So um, let's see, this verse uh, from Romans six twelve to 13 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Why would Paul write that if there wasn't sin in the lives of Christians. So it doesn't just come out and say that it's, you know, there's still sin in your hearts, but it's implying it, you know, why? And and uh, and it puts the uh, responsibility on us. Do not let sin reign. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John was written to Christians, to believers. And uh, so it's saying, if you think that you're above all this, think again. Um, Yet we cannot bring this sin in the presence of the Lord. So um, as far as where the Lord reigns in heaven. Um, uh, so to the church of the firstborn who, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So talking about the host of heaven, all the people in heaven, angels, people, standing before God, they are all made perfect. They are not in God's presence in heaven, the kingdom of heaven, as sinful human beings. Revelations 21 and 27 says nothing um, impure will ever enter it, talking about heaven again, uh, the kingdom of heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So something must happen to people whose names are written in the book of life to make us pure. Um, but even then, being in heaven and in spirit form, we will not be fully sanctified until we receive our resurrection bodies. So 2 Corinthians 7, 1 talks about um, uh, purifying ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, not just our spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transfer our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So, um, you know, and sin is, is falling short of the mark. So we live in corrupted bodies. Uh, these bodies, you know, we don't think of them as our body, our physical part of us making choices to be sinful. There's that moral aspect of sin, but it's also imperfection. And so there will be no sickness. There will be no um, no imperfection in heaven. We will have perfect bodies. And we truly become like Christ, not just in character, but in bodily form. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 23 says, But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So uh, it will happen when uh, at the second coming, at the, at the uh, second resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so that would be Adam in his corrupt body, having been corrupted at the initial um, rebellion in the garden, uh, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus. So it's comparing us as we are now in the image of Adam and saying in the future we'll be in the image of Christ. Sanctification is never completed in this life. Some people... Some Christians teach perfectionism. Uh, they ask, why would, would God give us a command we can't keep? And so some of the uh, key verses that they might go to uh, would be, and I'll just read them through, and you know, let's think, well, how would we answer this? I mean, And I've actually met uh, one person in particular who her church 
taught, teaches her and she believes that she has reached a, ta a, a stage of sinless perfection. And uh, it's kind of hard to argue with someone like that. Um, so, well, how would we, how, what, what would we have to say? So here's some verses. Um, Matthew 5, 48 says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So here's Jesus giving a command, and if he knows we can't keep it, why would he give us the command? So they, they would point to that. It implies that you, not only must you be perfect, you can be perfect. Um, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement, defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. And so again, something we do, let's cleanse ourselves and get to the state of perfection. I mean, we can't get rid of the sins in the past, but what people would say, well, but you can reach perfection. The problem is the sins of the past are very much a part of our being now, too. We're not perfect because we, if I, it, it couldn't, I couldn't do it, but if I could repent perfectly and never sin again, I'm still guilty for the things in the past. And not that God keeps a, 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 a record book, um, like we think of a, like a, a traffic cop, you know, keeping notes. God doesn't have to work at it. When he sees me, He's aware of my sins. Now, he might decide to treat me as if I'm sinless, but with no effort whatsoever, God sees everything that I've ever done, and that sin is still there. So I can't be perfect. Um, uh, you know, I can't get rid of the past sins, even if I could get rid of the future ones, which I can't uh, in this life. 1 John 3, 6, no one who abides in him sins. All right, let's talk about these. How, how is it that... Uh, uh, how would we answer someone who says uh, we can be perfect? Well, uh, all, all people, bless you, all people, even those dead in their sins, are commanded to obedience and held accountable for sin. So um, the emphasis of Jesus' teaching, the emphasis of the New Testament is to teach, and, and the Old Testament, is to teach all people not to sin, even people who are dead in their sins and obviously can't, they're, they're in bondage to sin. They can't free themselves. And yet the, the instructions are still there. Don't sin. Um, uh, so, um, uh, lost my place here. Uh, so, yeah, so if it applies to non-Christians, it would apply to Christians. If, if it says the same idea, don't sin, and you're responsible for it when you do, um, there must be something more than just saying don't sin and it's possible to stop. The fact that we can't attain God's standard of perfection doesn't mean he should lower the standard. So, uh, you know, should Jesus have, uh, in that Sermon on the Mount, said, you therefore, you should be perfect, but since you can't, just strive to be your best. I mean, is Jesus supposed to lower his standards just because we can't reach them? And so uh, it just, it points, so the, the you know, the, the point of the sermon that he was preaching in, he was talking about the law, and talking about how the Old Testament law is is even more important to follow in spirit, like it's it's wrong to kill, but don't even call someone a bad name in anger, you know, um, something we've all done. But um, so the point is to say God has a higher standard, and you all we all the more need His mercy and forgiveness. So and having a standard does give us something to strive towards, um, and uh, helps us to see that we can't reach it, and that we need something else. We need Christ. So, and the word sins in 1 John 3, 6 can be better translated continues to sin. And just, how do we know this? Well, just a few passages later, a few verses later in, in John 3, 9, says no one who is born of God will continue to sin uh, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning uh, because he has been born of God. So there's so there needs to be this constant... Um, uh, increasing in glory, sinning less and less. We should see that kind of growth in our lives. And uh, and when we do, we can know that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. But it doesn't mean we're going to be completely without sin. So, therefore, perfectionism can't be expected or attained. These passages are directed toward everyone born of God and would have to be true of everyone who has seen Christ and known Him. On the contrary, Scripture clearly teaches that we can't be morally perfect in this life. So, Ecclesiastes 7.20, indeed there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. So that would be the Old Testament uh, telling us what we also hear in the New Testament. Um, uh, especially, uh, I guess, uh, well, I guess I don't have it from Romans, but uh, you know, in Romans it says that no one, 
no one seeks after God. You know, without the help of God, not, all of us are sinful, and none of us seek after God. Matthew 6, 11 to 12 says, Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts or our sins, as we have also forgiven our debtors or those who sin against us. Why would Jesus ask us, give us this model prayer, if he didn't expect that we would um, have sins that need to be forgiven? So, um, so, so that's another uh, you know, passage that shows um, the reality of sin in our lives and our constant need for forgiveness. So Romans 6, 12 to 13, read that already. Don't let sin reign. James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Not some of us, not, uh, you know, not the, those backslidden people over there. No, all of us stumble in many ways. Um, 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, read that already. Uh, and uh, 1 Timothy 4, 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So, uh, part C, God and man cooperate in sanctification. So cooperation does not imply equal roles. So I don't, I don't want us to think that, you know, that's a heavy load if we think we have to at least bear half of the load of, you know, being sanctified. Uh, God is working uh, sanctification in our lives in ways that we have no idea what he's doing. Even the desire to want to be sanctified is a desire from God. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. So, um, but we do need to cooperate. So for Philippians 2, 12 to 13, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So there's, there's a responsibility given to us, and how can we reach it? We can obey as you've always obeyed, keep obeying work you know that's what the working out means is find those different parts of your lives that are that need to be brought under Christ's rule and uh, uh, work at obeying in every area of your life so um, so what's God's role first Thessalonians 5:23 may God himself the God of peace sanctify you through and through uh, Hebrews 12 5 to 11 and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. So it goes on to talk about the discipline of a loving father, you know, working in the life of his son. That's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. And uh, so as that son is tested and grows on to maturity, he's given harder and harder tests. And uh, and so this whole the discipline of God is is a form, it's a way that God sanctifies us. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act. So God is the one who gives us the will or the desire to uh, be sanctified. Hebrews 13.20-21 20 um, says, uh, look, uh, let's see, you guys see the, the, you don't see my pointer, do you? Okay. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, not read the longer passages all the way through, but towards the end it says, may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Pioneer means the one who began it. Perfecter is he continues it and brings it to completion. Who is it that does it? It's not just God the Father disciplining us. It's also working with Jesus, uh, the Son. Um, and then Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit. So it's all aspects of the Trinity are working in our hearts and in our lives to bring us to sanctification. Um, so Galatians 5, 16 to 18, towards the end, it says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Um, and again, Romans 8, 14 talks about being led by the Spirit. So what's our role? Well, we have two types of roles. One is Passive and one is active. So passive, what does is, what is passive involvement or responsibility mean in our lives? Um, it's, it's a way of saying let go and let God, but there's an action of letting go. And so it's, 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 act, it's passive in that we're trusting in God to do certain things, but uh, we need to take the responsibility to allow him to do those. So Romans 6.13 says, Do not offer any part of yourself as sin, to, to sin as an instrument of witness, but rather offer yourselves to God. So it's a it's a conscious choice that we make to say, 
God, you have your way in my life. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's passive because it's saying, God, I want you to take the reins. But we need to do it constantly. Part of the Christian life, part of my prayers every day is, God, you are in charge, not me. This is your life. Um, help me to get out of the way and allow you to work through me. So, um, again, Romans 6.19, offer yourselves as slaves. So saying, you're my master. You're my father. You love me, I know, but I'm, I also want to just obey you as a, as a slave would obey his master. Romans 12.1 talks about um, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So if, um, if it was completely not our responsibility, I guess we would be like a dead sacrifice. But what I take the, the living sacrifice to refer to is on a daily basis, we're saying, God, you're in control. I'm not. Um, I give you every aspect of my life. And, uh, you know, I may not, um, I may not uh, be asked for my life today like Jesus went to the cross. But in a thousand little ways, I'm dying to myself and giving myself to your service. And so that's a living sacrifice. Romans 8, 13 um, says, put to death the misdeeds of the body. And interesting thing, it says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. So it's with the Spirit's help. It's something that he inspires, something that he um, helps us to do, shows us the need to do, leads us, we follow. But this is, so there's an active obedience and, or a passive obedience and a passive sort of cooperation there. So it is. So Philippians two thirteen. It is God who works in you. Now, what about the active part? Romans eight thirteen says, "If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body." So it's by the Spirit, it's by the Spirit's help. But you need to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Philippians uh, two twelve to thirteen. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, and, there's, and the word obey is going to keep coming up. That's what it takes to be actively cooperating with God. We obey him. Not only in my presence, but also much more in my absence. This is Paul talking to the church in the Philippi. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act. So we need to take action on the things that God has given us the will to do. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's our effort. We need to make every effort. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. So it needs to involve that area of our lives, and we should actively avoid temptation, uh, things that would uh, put us close to the edge of the pool, in, uh, using that, that, that analogy. 1 John 3.3, 3, all of you, all who have this hope in him, purify themselves, just as he is pure. So a big emphasis on our responsibility to make sure that we are maturing in our faith and being made holy. Second Peter 1 5, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. Make every effort. Add to, you know, like keep working, keep cooperating with God. Um, and Hebrews 5 14, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Um, so what are some different ways in which we can do this? And this is really super important. I think without daily disciplines, um, we cannot train ourselves. Without Bible reading and meditation, prayer, sobriety, I threw that one in there because some of these have to do with that. And I don't just mean avoiding alcohol, but avoiding anything that would just consume our minds and distract us from Christ. So, you know, a person could be uh, a foodie, and all they're thinking about is like the next meal they're going to have and how they're going to cook it and, or how much they're going to eat or whatever. It's, 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 that's, they're not practicing sobriety. Um, there's probably another word for it. They're not being gluttonous. Um, but, uh, so I think that's a, a, a discipline of the, of the Christian life. So worship, witnessing, Christian fellowship, and self-discipline or self-control. So all of these have to do with those. Uh, Psalm 1 and 2 talks about meditating on God's word day and night. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word. And so comparing God's word to bread, you don't want to eat a Thanksgiving meal once a week and then go hungry the rest of the week. You want a little bit every day and even several times a day. 
And what if we were to meditate on God's word a little bit every day, maybe even several times a day, and take it in, you know, in a in a way where we're constantly reminded of it, we're able to digest it, you know, uh, in a way that's not just overwhelming. We're not drinking from a fire hydrant, you know, as Luke often says. Um, we're we're getting, you know, it's a constant. Com- if we think of God's reading God's word as communication with God, well, we pray, and then we take in His word as a you know, his authoritative word, and, and uh, he's constantly controlling our lives rather than just one big, huge um, meal once a week or every so often. Ephesians uh, six eighteen and pray in the Spirit on occasion, on all occasions. So prayer is another aspect of uh, uh, a daily discipline that we need to practice. Um, Philippians four six also says by prayer and petition. Present your request to God, thanksgiving. Um, different types of prayer would also be covered here. It talks about praising God um, and uh, you know, asking uh, other verses about prayer, asking for forgiveness, praising God, giving him glory, um, uh, counting your blessings, super important, that we don't become bitter, uh, but that we appreciate all that God has given us. Matthew 28, uh, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I was just talking with Angelo before class started about how much I'm learning from teaching. And uh, so I believe as we go witnessing, making disciples, teaching disciples, we grow ourselves. So I, I view, I totally view my outreach efforts as a, a daily discipline. Another aspect of it is there was a time in my life where I thought, you know what? I'm going to have goals towards Bible reading. I'm going to read a chapter a day. Well, I still have those goals. but uh, And I'm going to pray a certain amount a day. You know, And if I only viewed my relationship with God as a relationship, it's like, well, why should I have to set goals and be so formal about it? Why don't I just hang out with God, right? And it was, it was cool to have those goals and to ask God to help me with those goals. Well, witnessing, a lot of people think, well, it's not of the spirit if you have to plan it or if you have to force yourself to do it. or, And I view it as, Well, I have a goal, a witnessing goal, and I go out and I do this, and it's kind of, if I view it as like a daily discipline, it's it's a little bit different. It's 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 um, it's something that God helps me with, and um, and it's something that I can prepare for, and something that kind of keeps me on my toes constantly. So, definitely view witnessing and making disciples as a a discipline of the Christian life. Um, Hebrews ten twenty four to twenty five. Uh, kind of a well-known verse about the importance of church attendance. Do not give up meeting together, as some in the habit are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. One another. Galatians um, 5, 22 to 23, just to kind of cap it off, it talks about all the different things that are the fruit of the Spirit. One of them, the last one, is self-control. And so self-discipline, self-control are, um, oh, and then Titus 1 through 8 talks about being self-controlled and disciplined. And so we have to build up our ability to discipline ourselves. Um, Sometimes it might not seem like such a spiritual thing because we don't have that sense that God is constantly, you know, walking with us. Sometimes he might put us through a dry season and say, okay, let's see how you do without my constant help, you know? And he reminds us of how how much we need him. But... um, uh, the, you know, maybe one of the disciplines, I guess, a big discipline of the Christian life is it's easy to serve God and talk about God in some situations when the when the when the sun is shining and when everyone's happy and um, when everyone's in agreement with us. Uh, what about the days when it's raining and people don't want to hear about it, or when someone's in a bad mood, or when we don't feel real well? I mean, are we only basing our our uh, obedience to God on our feelings? What about the you know what about the times when we just don't feel like doing it, and uh, can we overcome those those negative feelings and still serve God in a lot of different ways? Um, so the self discipline means you know not just being feeling oriented. So I just threw this in there: uh, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trusting would be God's trusting, you know, that God is working sanctification in our lives, and passively in a passive sense, allowing him to do that. And then the obeying part is the active, you know, going out and actually doing what he says we should do. So 
right in that song, it's basically covering both aspects of our, you know, uh, cooperation with God. Sanctification affects the whole person, intellect, emotions, will. Um, so, uh, so Colossians 1.10 ends with growing in the knowledge of God. We are growing in our knowledge of God's word. We're growing in our knowledge of how it applies in our life and in our world. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world uh, or anything in the world. So sanctification involves our feelings of love and affection. Um, Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will. So it involves our will, intellect, emotions, will. Our will refers to decision making. You know, are we going to make decisions? Um, and uh, so God works in us to lead us to make the right decisions. Uh, but ultimately puts the responsibility on us to make those decisions. 2 Corinthians 7.1 um, talks about our spirit. So it involves us on a spiritual level. And uh, Romans 8.29, um, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's not just in our character or in our spirit, but also in our physical uh, our, our physical bodies. Uh, so as Jesus will come again physically, um, we will be sanctified physically. Okay, so what are some motives for obedience to God in the Christian life? One, uh, the, probably the most basic one, would be a, please, a desire to please God and express our love to him. And uh, so Jesus, on the night, I believe this was before he was resurrected. Maybe i, I got to get this right because it might have been talking to his disciples after he was resurrected. But he said, if you love me, keep my commands. So, you know, how can, if he died for us, how can we express our love for him? Keep his commands. One of the first things I remember thinking as a new Christian was, okay, uh, Jesus, you died for me. I do love you. I'm going to keep your commands. What are they? I don't know. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a real strong Bible background. So I started reading my Bible for the express purpose of saying, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do? You know, I want to, Get this right. And uh, so if you love me, keep my commands. And uh, so those verses there talk about that. This is love for God in 1 John 5, 3, to keep his commands. His commands are not burdensome. But what are some other reasons for uh, obedience? Two, the, the need to keep a clear conscience before God. So, um, you know, no one wants to be in a ministry where you're uh, preaching something and Oftentimes, you find yourself are the one you're preaching to. Um, so, uh, and that happens often, but it's a matter of conscience. Uh, and there's many references to our conscience. The, I think of the conscience as a, like a moral referee in our brain. And I believe it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, God gives us, everybody, uh, a conscience, a moral conscience. And why is it that we're conflicted about, you know, sinful activities? And, uh, oftentimes, is because we're arguing with the ref. And we're saying, hey, but, you know, let me off this time. Or, you, you know, like, uh, I think I have a good reason. Um, and uh, so if we have that kind of an argument in our minds, we are going to be double-minded, as James talked about, and uh, not able to concentrate on serving the Lord the way he wants us to. So all of these, the rest of these verses here have to do with keeping a good and clear conscience. Uh, number three, the desire to be a vessel for noble use and have increased in effectiveness in the work of the kingdom. So noble has a um, connotation of being special, um, you know, not being commonplace. And, uh, and I think there's a, you know, it's a God-given desire to want to be uh, used for a special purpose, used in a special way by God, not to just be part of the common things of the world. Um, and so this verse from 2 Timothy refers to that. The articles of gold and silver and wood and clay. It's okay to want to be, um, to want to be a something that is of great value in God's house uh, and special and set apart. Four, the desire to see unbelievers come to Christ through observing our lives. So First Peter talks about that for wives. Uh, submit to your husbands so that if they are not believers, they can be won over. So that would be a motivation. Uh, or why should we? Be ready to give an answer to everyone who uh, asks us in First Peter three fifteen to sixteen, um, so that we can uh, help people to be ashamed of their slander. It's kind of a way of saying help them see that we're right, that there's truth here, um, and uh, hopefully leading them towards Christ. 
So uh, number five, uh, another reason to want to be sanctified, the desire to receive pre ple present blessings from God on our lives and ministries. Um, I believe God doesn't ask us to do anything to serve him without giving us the tools with which to do it. And so, you know, if God is giving us more blessings, that means he has more responsibilities for us. Um, and we can use those blessings in ways that bring honor and glory to him. And so, uh, you know, a big prayer, the prayer of Jabez from years ago, if any of you guys remember that, was increase my lands. Um, but it was for the purpose of serving the Lord, I believe. Um, increase, my, increase the blessings in my life so that I can serve you even more. It would be kind of like the person who was given, you know, five talents to say, you know, Lord, I was faithful with these five talents. Give me ten. I will serve you even more uh, with what you've given me. And I think that's okay. So, let's see. All right. Six, the desire to avoid God's displeasure and discipline on our lives. So we should continue in the fear of the Lord. I mean, a lot of people say you shouldn't fear God. Those are people of the world that only want to believe God is love. But God is, I guess the best way I can think of it is God has tough love. Tough love means, to me, means you're willing to put up with someone not liking you for a little while for their best interest. And so if God is our Heavenly Father and he disciplines us, there might be times when we're mad at God. And uh, um, the times when he has to discipline us. Probably one of the bigger prayers in my life has been, Lord, let me learn my lessons well the first time. So I don't have to learn them again, because <laughs> sometimes they're pretty hard lessons, and uh, there's a huge price to pay, and sometimes it affects other people, too. Um, so I have a fear of God, a fear of his discipline, a fear of his tough love, that he has to be tough with me. And, uh, and so it's okay that uh, we continue with a reverence or a respect and a fear of God as our Heavenly Father disciplining us. Um, so these verses have to do with that. Ephesians 4. 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So it's not just God's displeasure, God's discipline, but also when we sin, when we give in to the ways of the world, the Holy Spirit lives within us, he's sealed within us, he does not leave us, but he's not happy. And we, we grieve him, and we feel that grief, and we feel that conflict in our lives. We may end up being depressed, or, you know, uh, we will feel it in some way. Um, so, uh, talking about being disciplined, show pro proper respect to everyone, love the family of God, fear, family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. So kind of, you know, if, if we have difficulty with that word fear, like God is like almost like, you know, we think of a, a cruel master that, that, you know, a dog cowers before him because he's used to being beat. That's not, uh, that's not how it is. That's not the type of fear that God is. Uh, telling us we need to have. It's, it's more of a respect kind of thing. Uh, respect for God, who he is, and, who, and who, the power that he has. Um, number seven, the desire to seek greater heavenly reward. So the Bible does talk about rewards. There are rewards in heaven. Um, Store up yourselves treasures in heaven, Jesus said in Matthew 6. Uh, and uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 refers to, uh, you know, what are the things in our lives that will go through the fire of judgment and, uh, and some things will just be burned up, the things that we do that have no eternal value. Um, but we want to have things, we don't want to go to the birthday party of, you know, the, the, the wedding banquet without a gift for, for uh, you, you know, for the, for the bridegroom or for the, you know, the host. Uh, we don't want to go empty-handed. The Bible says we, you know, some people will go empty-handed. Um, so it says the builder will receive a reward if it is bur burned up. The builder will suffer loss, but yet be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. Well, one escaping through the flames brings nothing with him. If someone's house is burned down, they are just glad they are alive. And will I be, if that's the case with me and I have nothing to offer, no, re you know, the Bible talks about the elders, you know, receiving crowns as rewards. And what do they do with those crowns in heaven? They lay them before the king. It's like, I'm going to take the reward that I was given, and this is my present to you. But if I end up in heaven and I'm just escaping through the flames, I will just be glad I, I'm there and uh, that my name is written in the book of life. So, um, uh, all right. And the desire for a deeper walk with God would be another reason. 
Um, and so uh, we have fellowship with God. Why do we want to grow in sanctification? We, we understand the joy of our salvation and the joy of walking with God. Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated you from God. So, you know, this is even getting back to the Garden of Eden. What was the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned? They hid. They, they realized God sees everything. We're naked. We're exposed. We can't. Let's go hide. And God sought them out. Um, that's what sin, that's the effect of sin has in our lives, even as Christians. It separates us from God and, and destroys our fellowship with God. So... Uh, number nine, the desires that angels would glorify God for our obedience. I think that's a, you know, it's it's pretty humbling or pretty, I don't know, scary maybe to think that the hosts of heaven are watching us and they're reacting to our obedience or disobedience. And so the things that we do carry magnified significance because, um, you know, all of heaven is responding when we, either for good or for evil, uh, when we choose different actions. Um, Ten, the desire for peace and joy in our lives. Um, so, yeah, if if the Holy Spirit is living within us and we're acting in ways contrary to the Holy Spirit, you can forget having any kind of peace or joy in your life. To the extent that we follow him and obey him and work with him, we will experience the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Number eleven, a lot of different reasons uh, for uh, seeking to do our part for sanctification. Number 11, the desire to do what God commands simply because his commands are right and we delight in doing what is right. So as we are given that new desire uh, to, to do what is right, um, we have we just have delight in, in seeing good happen through our lives. So finally, the beauty and joy of sanctification. Um, so the fruit of the Spirit talks about it in Galatians 5. Um, and uh, some of the other just aspects of uh, changing our character. Uh, the result is eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 22. 1 John 3, 3 says, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So we sense a growing sense of just beauty uh, and joy, peace. Um, we were created to be all that God created us to be. Uh, and to, and to fulfill that purpose, to become more and more like Christ, um, is a beautiful thing. Jesus is beautiful. And, the, and to the extent that we can become more and more like him in our character and avoiding sin in our lives, uh, we can actually become beautiful uh, like Jesus. Amen? Amen.